Hi there, my name is Jeff. I work in the Applications Department here at Wardjet. And today we're going to take a few minutes to walk through programming and cutting apart on one of our abrasive water jets. So we'll take a look at programming, things like how to clamp your material, inner workings of the cutting head. We'll look at a couple different style pumps, as well as talk about the abrasive and bulk feed hoppers and fun things like that. So as we're going along, if there are any questions that come up, please feel free to type them into the question box and we'll answer those at the end. And let's go ahead and jump into WardCam. We'll walk through the steps of programming a part here in our WordCam software. So WordCam is supplied with our machines. You can get unlimited copies of this, so you could install it on every computer in your company if you wanted to and program from wherever. So this will open up DXF and DWG files. There's also a shape library. So if there's any parametric shapes in here you'd like to program, just click on those and enter the dimensions. We can add shapes to this library. If you need a different shape, let us know and we can program that for you. So I'm gonna open up a DXF file. So we'll take this one here. The top right hand corner we hit our next button and top left hand corner we choose our nozzle orifice combination that we're using so we're going to be cutting with a 10 thousandths orifice 30 thousandths abrasive nozzle and we'll be doing aluminum quarter inch in the background of the material database each of these materials each thickness has five different speeds associated with it from slow and smooth to fast and rough. Each of those has a high and low speed. When we come to a corner, we ramp down to the low speed and then we ramp back up to the high speed. And then you can also define things like what you want for length of lead-in for inside and outside cuts. And if you want a tab width, so smaller part, you don't want to fall into the tank, you can give it a, a tab width so to control that. So we've got our material and thickness selected top right hand corner we hit our next button this screens where we add our tool path top left hand corner you can click on the auto button red lines are cuts blue lines are rapids or traverses between cuts if you zoom in you can see the red line is offset from the solid of the part to show that the tool path is being offset by half of the tool diameter to account for the width of the stream and we've got our leads on there so we pierce in the scrap area and then lead into the cuts if you want to change your lead position, you can just left click and change it. If you want to do things like change cut quality, over here top right hand corner, all of these cuts are in red, which is the mid-range normal speed. So if we wanted to do inside cuts as slowest, smoothest speed, I can multi-select for those and then come down and choose a different quality on those. You can also decide to do individual cuts at different speeds on the inside so if these two when you want to do those at the smooth you can change that and then in a similar fashion you can do the same thing for a portion of a cut so with this partial qualities tool here if I expand this if the bottom edge of the part wasn't so critical you can choose the fastest speed click a couple points there left click to lock that in and if on the top edge we wanted that to be again slower and smoother you can choose different quality for that area and then left click lock that in there so we've got our tool path top right hand corner hit your next button top left hand corner click on the CNC button to create our CNC file if you want to you can have this preview open up here that shows the code that we run we do run standard G code so things like G01 for straight line G03 for an arc if you don't care about seeing that code, that's an option, you can just turn that off. Once you've created the CNC file, you can click on the report button. So this will generate a report that gives information such as estimated cutting time, shows you image of the part with the different qualities on there, information to the operator about nozzle orifice combination, material and thickness, you can type notes in here, And then in the lower portion, if you want, you can print up costing information, give you an idea about what you would, could charge per part, hourly charges, plug in over here on the left, 
what you paid for the machine, interest, overhead, etc., abrasive, all that can go into calculating what you could charge per part for this. So once you've got that, then we can go ahead and we'll load that at the machine and cut that. First thing we'll take a look at is clamping your material. When you're doing abrasive water jet cutting, it's very important to clamp your material to the grates. There is going to be a fair bit of turbulence in that water as you're cutting. You don't want that turbulence to move your plate. Sometimes people ask if I've got material that's three, four, five, six inches thick, do I really need to clamp it? And our answer has always been, it's worth it to take the few minutes to go around, put a few clamps on that material so it doesn't move because you'd hate to spend an hour or more cutting a part and find out that the part was ruined because the material had moved slightly. So we supply clamps like this with machine. It's got a uh, hook on there, threaded rod, and basically this hooks onto the, uh, the bottom of our job shop grate, and then you can just use your impact driver and very easily go around and clamp down your material. So it's pretty easy just to put these around. Usually you want to put three or four around your plate. So we'll just put that one underneath that grate there. Got our impact driver. Another important thing, a couple important things. We've got a piece of material of similar thickness on the other end of our clamp here, and that'll keep the clamp from potentially squeezing the material out of it. So you want to try to have something of similar thickness on the other end of the clamp. And then the other key thing to watch for is that you want to pinch your material between a grate and the clamp, especially if you're doing thinner material. If you clamp it away like here, you might deflect the material, and then it can come loose as you're cutting. And then, of course, you always want to consider the program that you're cutting, the size of it, the part that you're cutting, where it's going to be on your sheet. And since we're doing, going to be doing a part down here, I can safely clamp this up here. And we'll just put these other ones around the other side here. So with that, the material's nice and stable. That shouldn't move on me, and I can feel good about that. So now let's talk a little bit about the different style grates that we offer. This is a section of our job shop grate that we typically supply with most machines. Depending on the size of your machine, you'll get one, two, three, four, even more sections of this in the machine, which is nice is as you chew through sections, you can flip them over, you can move them around, rotate them, get really good life out of them. Another thing that gives you good life out of these grates is that we use 16 gauge, 1.6 millimeter thick material here. So as the stream's cutting across here, very quickly we'll jump across that so you don't dig in as far. Most slat design systems will use 8 inch, 3 millimeter thick material, and that tends to dig in a little bit more as you cut across there. Also with the slat design where you've only got one slat going across, as you cut across the slat it's going to lose its rigidity very quickly. Whereas here you've got the support of all the other cells around there. So you get very good life out of these grates and you can clamp anything anywhere on these which makes it for a very flexible system and being able to move these around in the tank makes it so you get very long life out of these. This is our weld bot that we use for welding up the job shop grates. Inside of each of those 4x4 cells, there's eight welds. So when I first started here about 12 years ago, it was a manual process to go around and do all that welding. And then about 10 years ago, we took one of our water-only gantries and put the welding head on there. We've got our controller on here. So somebody can set this up and about half an hour later, come back and have a completed job shop grate. And then this gets inspected for flatness before it ships to you. So this is another style grate that we offer that we refer to as the heavy duty grate. This is made out of half inch steel, it's welded, five inches thick. So if you're doing a steady diet of thicker materials, say two inches and thicker, you've got bigger parts, you might want to consider a grate like this. This one's also fairly simple, you could make this one up yourself and make a different slat configuration depending on your part size. Alright, next up we'll take a look at the cutting head. First we'll take a look at the things that we can see externally and then we'll 
take a look at one that's taken apart so you can see some of the internal components. So first of all, up here we have an actuator. This has an airline going to it. This has some very strong springs in it. When we want the cutting head to open, the controller sends a signal to a solenoid, lets air flow to this. It takes a little bit of pressure off those springs, just enough such that the high pressure water can then actually push up a needle from a seat that we'll show you here in a moment. And then that allows your high pressure water to then go down through your cutting head. So this line coming in from the side here, that's your stainless steel high pressure line. You've got the lower portion of your cutting head here. We've got an adapter and then the abrasive cutting head body here. We've got our abrasive coming in from the side here. And then inside of here, we've got an orifice. Orifice changes the 60,000 PSI of pressure above there to speed. So it comes out of the orifice at in excess of 2,000 miles per hour. That creates a, a venturi or suction effect inside the cutting head. And then that sucks the abrasive into the cutting head. Uh, there's a little mixing chamber in here that we'll see in a bit. And then you've got your abrasive nozzle. And then your abrasive water jet stream comes out the bottom there. And going back this way. So this feeds up to our mini hopper here. Underneath this blue cover, we have an anti-backflow device. So should you ever get water going back up the abrasive inlet, this has flaps in it that should allow water and abrasive to come out there rather than getting all the way into your mini hopper. So let's take a look at those internal components now. So here's a nice breakdown of the cutting head, starting first again with the actuator that has those springs in there to keep the needle and seat together that we'll see here in a minute. Air goes into there. It has a little muffler on here. If this gets uh, plugged up with uh, abrasive over time, just need to unthread that, blow that out. And then you go down to the valve body, which contains your needle and seat. So this is what the spring acts against. So it pushes the needle against the seat there to keep your high pressure water from going through the cutting head. And then when air is applied to that actuator, the high pressure water can push up on that needle and allow it to go to the cutting head. So your high pressure water comes in here through the valve body. Inside here, there's a bullet. So it's a couple different styles of a bullet, standard bullet. There's also a bullet that accepts one of these little thimble filters. So this thimble filter can act as a final filter to catch any debris that might be coming down your high pressure line. Uh, so even if you're not using a diamond, it can help to extend the life of your orifice. Anytime that we quote a diamond orifice, we always quote it with the thimble filter as part of the, uh, the warranty on the, the diamond. So the, th the bullet that accepts the thimble filter has a little recess here that that would slide into. And going down from there, we've got our adapter. And then you get down to the orifice that goes inside the cutting head. So the orifice can be made out of either ruby, sapphire, or diamond. Each one has a different price point and different life. Uh, if you're still using rubies for a few dollars more, I find the sapphires to be much more resilient. So maybe worth it to consider at least going up to the sapphires. And then the diamonds are nice because they are guaranteed for at least 600 hours if you do have that final filter installed. And nice thing about that is, of course, you can just put it in and not have to worry about it for several months at a time. Whereas your ruby and sapphire, they can be anywhere from zero to 40 hours. You've got your abrasive cutting heads, so the orifice would go down into there. And then the abrasive comes in from the side there. Also inside the cutting head, you have the mixing chamber. So the abrasive will come in from the side and that's where the abrasive and the water mix together. And then you've got your abrasive nozzle. So this goes into your nut and this will thread up onto there. And so this is just a hand tighten thing. So if you need to change your abrasive nozzle, just be a couple minutes, unthread it, put a new one in there. It's got a little collet to hold it in place. And then if you're doing water only cutting, let's see if I can get that in the right orientation, get that back together later. If 
you're doing water only cutting, there's a water only adapter which places the orifice at the bottom of the adapter and that has it then closer to your material so you get a very fine stream. So if you want to do very detailed work water only cutting, you can buy a specific water only adapter for a finer stream. If you're only periodically doing water only cutting, you can of course just use the abrasive cutting head and just not turn on the abrasive and you'll have a water only stream. Uh, the diameter of the stream will be equal to the diameter of whatever abrasive nozzle that you've got there. So now let's take a look at the mini hopper and the bulk feed hopper and the feeding of abrasive. So the abrasive that most people typically use is garnet, which is a naturally occurring inert substance, various deposits around the world. Uh, we like the GMA product. It's a very clean, reliable product. This comes in different mesh sizes. Most people for doing metal cutting are going to use 80 mesh. If you're doing very thin material and you want to reduce burr on the back side, you could go with a 120 mesh. And then sometimes people cutting glass, they want a much smoother edge, they can go again with a 120 mesh or even a 220 mesh. So the finer the mesh, the smoother the edge is going to be. You'll also have to cut a little bit slower because each little particle of abrasive has a little bit less power to it. So now we'll go ahead and take a look at our bulk feed hopper options. So here we're looking at the side of one of our A-series machines, and this is the base bulk feed hopper that's quoted with this system. So this will hold about 85 pounds of abrasive. And then down here there's a pinch valve, which is uh, controlled by air. And then down here on this vessel we've got a couple proximity switches. When the abrasive gets below the lower proximity switch, pinch valve opens, allows it, the abrasive to drop down into this vessel here. This then gets pressurized and that abrasive is pushed over to the mini hopper over by the cutting head. So we've also got a 400 pound version of this that we'll show you here in a moment. Nice thing about this is you don't have to depressurize in order to fill this up. So as you're cutting and you're starting to get low, you can come over here, just open up the top and pour more abrasive in there. So here we have the 400 pound version of what we just looked at. So the lower components are the same. Upper vessel is just bigger to hold that 400 pounds. And same idea on this one. As you're cutting and this gets low on abrasive, you can simply open up the top and fill that up without having to stop the machine. And then this one also has a sensor on the vessel. So when the abrasive gets below that sensor, the light will turn from green to yellow, indicating it's time to put some more abrasive in here. And then ultimately if you run out, then that light will turn to red and the controller will stop your program. We also offer fully pressurized bulk feed hoppers like this one. So if we have to push abrasive through a couple hundred feet of abrasive hose, we'll typically recommend this style bulk feed hopper. The entire vessel is pressurized, which means when this does get low and you need to refill it, you'll need to stop your machine, depressurize this, fill it up, repressurize, so you'll be down for a few minutes while you go through that process. And now we'll take a look at the mini hoppers we offer. This is our smart meter mini hopper. We'll typically quote this when somebody's doing a lot of low and high pressure piercing for piercing, say, glass, for example. When the pump is in low pressure, we send a signal to that mini hopper, which has the wheels spin at a relatively low rate to let less abrasive down to the cutting head. And then when the pump goes up into high pressure, then the wheel will spin at a higher rate, letting more abrasive down to the cutting head. So if you're doing a lot of low and high pressure piercing for glass or composites, then this is a nice mini hopper option. This is what we refer to as our standard or manual mini hopper. This is what most people are going to use when they're cutting metals and they don't need to be doing a lot of low pressure and high pressure piercing and they're typically going to run one abrasive flow rate. So this has a slider here on the front and this number will correspond with a particular abrasive flow rate. If you've got, for example, a 30 horsepower pump and you're cutting with a 10 thousandths orifice, 30 thousandths abrasive nozzle, you're going to be using about three quarters of a pound of abrasive per minute and you're going to have this slider down for just under four. And if you're cutting with a 50 horsepower pump and a 14 thou orifice, 40 thou abrasive nozzle, you'll have this up closer to six.
and there's a calibration process that you can go through to ensure that you are getting the proper abrasive flow rates. So in here there's a uh, little bladder which is air controlled so when we don't want to let abrasive go down to the cutting head there's air in that bladder, a little balloon basically fills up so the abrasive can't fall down through there and then when we're ready for that abrasive to go down to the cutting head we turn off the air to that the little bladder deflates and then the abrasive can go down to the cutting head and then up here is of course where the abrasive is coming from the bulk feed hopper so finally before cutting let's go ahead and take a look at the pump that makes our high pressure so hypotherm offers a couple of different pumps that we'll be talking about here could spend a whole webinar talking about uh, design of pumps and such just give you a brief overview here so this is a intensifier style pump the bottom here we have electric motor this is part of the Echion series this is available in either 30 or 50 horsepower and then at the end of this we have a hydraulic pump so it creates 3,000 psi of oil pressure which goes up to this section here there's a biscuit that goes back and forth and then at the end of the, uh, the biscuit on each side there's a plunger and there's a 20 to 1 surface area difference between the two and then that creates your 60,000 psi of water pressure coming out each end and I've got a little cross section of each of these intensifiers I'll show you here in a moment so basically that process repeats back and forth creates your 60,000 psi water pressure water goes out through these high pressure lines through a attenuator which removes any sort of pressure spikes and then that goes off to your cutting head so over here we have a pump from their p-series predictive series so this is available in either 50 60 or 75 horsepower this is a 75 horsepower similar type concept electric motor hydraulic pump creates your 3000 psi of oil pressure up to the center section biscuit moves back and forth creating that 60,000 psi of water pressure this has the addition of things like a uh, drip tray so that's part of the predictive portion of the name where the tray will collect water uh, from each of those cylinders it's got tubes down here that those will drop through they got little optical sensors that'll count the number of drips and give you an indication of when you might need to change seals on the pump so let's take a look at the uh, cross section for these so on the bottom we have a cutaway of the intensifier from the Ischian style pump and on the top we have a cutaway from the predictive style pump so again concepts are pretty similar you got your center section when you get the biscuit and you'd have your oil with your 3000 psi of oil pressure there pushes the biscuit back and forth you got your ceramic plungers 20 to 1 surface area and you get your high pressure water coming out the ends here a couple little quick differences on this again there's several things that we could talk about but just briefly this has a direct sensing of the uh, the stroking so proximity switches basically go right in here to sense when that's going back and forth uh, this one here has this whole assembly that gets triggered uh, when this moves and then there's a switch up here that tells it that it's reached the end of its stroke to then have it go in the other direction uh, the predictive style P series has basically soft seals on each end of the high pressure cylinder Eschen style pump it's got a traditional um, rubber soft style seal on this end but this end it's a hard seal so the valve body here seals against the high pressure cylinder so fewer parts in the uh, Eschen style intensifier a little bit lower operating cost so those are a couple of little differences between those I think we're ready to go ahead and load our program and cut something so we've got our material clamp down and we'll just run through the steps for loading the part here on the controller so down in the bottom here I can click on this part button brings up a list of parts and here's the part that we created click on this button here and that'll load it into my cutting area and what I'll do first here is go ahead and jog my cutting head down to my appropriate cutting height we do offer height setter options on some of our machines we don't have this option on this machine right now so I'm just manually going to jog my cutting head down we want to be about eighth of an inch off the material so in this uh, controller we've got different speeds that we can jog down at so you can jog down at a fast speed and then when you get close you can choose to go into snail speed go slower and those speeds are customizable and you can also if you prefer switch over to incremental mode and choose to bump by 
three different increments here. So that height there is pretty good. Looks like we're about an eighth inch off the material. And I'll go back into continuous jog mode and just jog to the lower left hand corner of my material. So this is the turtle mode right now, 25 inches a minute. Again, those speeds are customizable. And we're in our lower left hand corner of our material there. So this program is going to be cut to the right and up from where we're currently located. You can also do things like save positions on your table. So if I click on this offset button over here, click on this plus button at the top. If I'm going to be cutting this part the same location over and over again, I can save this position and repeatedly cut it here. This will save the X, Y, and Z position. If we zoom in, it shows us the little target there is where we currently are. So if I were to jog away from there, right now the part moves with my cutting head. If I want to go back to that location, select that in my list here, click on Save Position, and the cutting head will move back to that location. Down here, lower right-hand corner, we've got our absolute positions, X, Y, Z, and the white numbers. If I click on there, toggle that, you can zero out these relative numbers here. Again, if you want to make sure that you're coming back here at the same start position, mix, see that those will zero out when we come back to that start position. If I want to cut multiples of these, I can click on the parts. Got some different options they can do in here, such as rotate, mirror, and X and Y. Up here at the top, we've got the array option. And we'll do one row, two columns. You can adjust your spacing between rows and columns. Once you have things as you like them here, click on the check button. And that will grid those out for you like that. So over here, top left hand corner, click on the pump on button, turn our pump on. Click on these buttons here to have the water and the abrasive turn on when it sees you code in our program here. So over here we've got the code that we'll be running. So line 17 M60 tells water to turn on. Line 18 M70 turns the abrasive to turn on. And then at the end of the cut, M71 turns abrasive off. M61 turns water off. So as it's cutting, we'll show you a couple other features here. So click on run. So one of the features is a restart feature if I stop, so if I had forgotten to turn my pump on or forgot to turn my abrasive on, something like that, and I want to recut a portion of this or the whole cut there, I can click on this. I've got options like jump to pierce point, jump to any point, jump to starting point. So if I would lost my cut partway through there, I can do jump to any point, and we can zoom in. And if I want to resume my cut somewhere down here, click on that point, click on this point jump and then the cutting head moves back to that location. And then we can click on resume. We can also do things like change our feed rate on the fly if we want to. Down here in the lower right hand corner, click down here. I can use this slider if I want to change my speed. Since I'm logged in right now as administrator, I can do that. You can also lock people out of being able to do things like that. We've got a measuring tool over here. Click on this. I'm not sure how large both of these parts are together. You can click on points and it'll show me the X and the Y and the uh, diagonal between those two points that I just clicked. If I click on this follow button, it keeps that blue cursor centered on my screen, which is where my cutting head currently is on the part. Over here on the left, it highlights where I am in my code. Just got zoom buttons here, so you can zoom in, user scroll wheel, excuse me, zoom out, user scroll wheel to zoom in. Over here at the right on the bottom, maintenance button. So this you can track the life of the consumable items on your machine. And you can set up time limits and get notification of 
when these items need to be changed. The controller can also send you emails so that you know what programs are being run on your machine. corner over here it shows us current progress of this job. Settings area up here can control things like whether you want to see that G code in the background there. When you're doing measure mode, if you want to snap to points, turn that on. where you can set up your additional users and give them their different permission levels. And then this is where you can determine who can do what on the machines. So if you don't want the operator to be able to change feed rates, you can change this to either maintenance or administrator level. Right now, since I am logged in as administrator, if I go ahead now, log in as operator, so then the operator can't change those feed rates. And I'll just go ahead and log back in as administrator. program is done, leaves a ghost image there. So if you then want to cut another part, and we click back into the parts list here, and we want to cut this now, and we click on the play button, it'll show you where those parts were cut on the table. This right now is showing up in red because it's going to cut beyond the extents of my cutting area. So let me go up into rabbit mode here, jog a little bit faster, so then you can jog and position this so that you avoid cutting into the parts that you've already cut out of that sheet of material. So I'll just go ahead and jog back. So there we go, got, a, got our parts cut. Well, I hope that was enjoyable and informative. And if you have any questions, we'll go ahead and answer those right now.